Hello and great welcome once again. So now in this particular session, we are going to have a look over section B and section B also contains 20 marks. This question is of one mark. Of course, we are discussing December 2021 paper. Section A has been completed. Section B now we will have a look at. And uh, this particular section in comparison to section A, to be very honest, is a little bit what we call, uh, uh, you can say, more relaxable. So in this particular section, let's start with question number one. Question number one. So property, plant and equipment appeared in the books at rupees 50 lakh in the trial balance of Malia Company Limited, which is, which is not a going concern. It is not a going concern. You should be aware of this particular fact. Okay. <clears throat> if a particular entity is not a going concern, then all the assets and liability of that particular entity must be reflected at net realizable value correct at net realizable value property plant and equipment further it is given are subject to a depreciation of 10 percent on written down value basis and realizable value of property plant and equipment happens to be 80 percent and realizable realizable expenses amounted to five percent what amount of depreciation will be shown in the income statement of malia company limited honestly speaking the question should have been actually at what amount property plant and equipment should be shown in the income state in the balance sheet but anyway they have have asked actually what amount should be reflected in the income statement correct so in the income statement what amount i will reflect i will have to reflect it this manner in this manner in this particular question first of all in the rough i will compute what i know that value of property plant and equipment if you want to write please write it but write it fast value of property plant and equipment is 50 lakh it is given very clearly that 10 percent is our rate of depreciation in normal circumstances in normal circumstances if malia company would not have been a going concern entity suppose if this particular line would not have been given that mean if malia limited would have been a going concern entity in that case i would have computed the carrying amount in this manner 50 lakh minus 10 percent depreciation 45 lakh and then i would have also computed the realizable value the realizable value it is given that 50 lakh into 80 percent 50 lakh into 80 percent that is equal to 40 lakhs but realization realizable expenses are also there and realization expenses are to the extent of five percent so five percent of 40 lakh will be equal to two lakh if my entity would have been a going concern would have been a going concern i would have had reflected 38 at 38 lakh the lower figure between the carrying amount and the realizable value in normal circumstances i'm talking about i would have re i would have had reflected this property plant and equipment in my what we call balance sheet at 38 lakh besides that i would have charged 5 lakh worth of depreciation to the profit and loss account and the difference between 45 lakh and 30 38 lakh would have been treated as a sort of impairment loss and that loss too would have been debited to profit and loss account in normal accountancy in normal accounts however here it is given that it is not a going concern if it is not a going concern obviously i will have to reflect the property plant and equipment at 38 lakh and now i will take the difference between these two value because right now property plant and equipment is appearing in the books at 50 lakh so i will have to bring it down to 38 lakh logically instead of writing depreciation i would have had written in my income statement loss on property plant and equipment 12 lakh instead of what we call writing what we call depreciation but anyway question has simply asked us what is the amount of depreciation in this case we will take the difference of these two 50 lakh 50 lakhs and 38 lakhs and i am going to actually reflect it to the debit side of my profit and loss account is it clear to you so answer is correct 12 lakh in this particular case question number two actually deals with uh, what we call your as5 correct prior period net profit for the period prior period and accounting estimate and changes in accounting policy here it is while analyzing the financial statement of the year ended 31st 3 2021 company finds that stock sheets of 31st 3 2020 did not include two pages containing the details of the inventory worth rupees 10 lakhs 
Now, what happened in this particular case? In the current year, your current year is ending on 31st of 3, 2021. In the current year, correct? In the current year, you found out that valuation stock, valuation of stock as on 31st of 33, 31st of 3, 2020 is incorrectly done. You found out on 31st of 3, 2021 that valuation of stock on 31st 3 2020 is not done correctly because two sheets which contain the details of the valuation of the inventory you did not take into account so that is the problem automatically it means the value of closing stock is wrong if closing stock is written at a lower value because you did not include details or details containing in the two sheets so obviously this value which is being represented now is quite obviously quite less Correct. Now the problem is that because I wrote the closing stock last year at a lesser lesser value, it means profit and loss account which I must have re reflected is also being represented at a lower value. That means profit and loss of last year or previous year is understated because of this particular mistake, number one. And number two, as per AS5, any item of income and expense, any item of income and expense which is related to earlier years, correct? Which is related to earlier years. So, in this particular item, this is an item of closing stock and it is related to earlier years, but you detected it in the current year. So, quite obviously, in the current year, it will be treated as a prior period item. So, this uh, item will be treated as a prior period item number one and number two you will also write it previous years profit and loss account is undervalued because we did not take into account two details of the stock containing in the two sheets in this case stock sheet on 31st 3 2020 did not include two pages containing details of the inventory worth rupees 10 lakh correct Yes, they have written also amount 10 lakh. That means the last year or previous year's profit is undervalued by this particular amount. Correct number one. And this will be treated as a prior period item. Why it will, it will be treated as a what we call prior period item? Because it is related to the last year and it is detected in the current year. So that is why it is a prior period item. Question number three states that on 1st of April 2020, share capital of S Limited consists of 10 crore equity share capital of rupees 10 each. So there is a company by the name of S Limited. There is a company, just let me actually settle it out because otherwise it is going to create problem. I have to delete it. Yes, in this particular question, it is given that there is a company by the name of S Limited. This company has equity share capital and preference share capital both. It has got equity share capital to the extent of 10 crore, correct, 10 crores, figures are in crores and one share is of 10 each and rupees 12 crore worth of 10% preference share capital. This company also has 10% preference share capital and preference share capital is worth rupees 12 crores and one share is of 100 each as far as preference share capital is concerned. <coughs> Further, it is given preference share capital is convertible into equity shares. Preference share which is given to you is convertible into equity share. It is also given in the question. Correct. Now, on 1st of July, on 1st of July 2020, H Limited acquired 50 lakh equity shares and 6.2 lakh preference shares of S Limited. On 1st of July, it is written that there is a company by the name of H Limited. On 1st of July 2020, H Limited acquired out of 10 crores worth of share capital 50 lakhs equity share. 50 lakhs equity share into 10 means 5 crores. Because one share is our rupees 5 each. So that means out of 10 crore, 5 crore worth of share capital is now in the hands of H Limited. It is exactly 50%. It is exactly 50%. Further. Not only they acquired what we call this mount, they also acquired 10% preference share capital to the extent of 6.2 lakh share. And one share is of rupees 100 each. So that comes to near about what we call 6.2 crores. 
out of 12 crores now 6.2 crores worth of preference share capital is also in our hand number one if more than 50 percent voting rights because now in this case h limited holds more than 50 percent voting rights of the other entity that is s limited obviously s limited is our subsidiary company number one number two when we say 50 percent of voting rights the voting rights include not only the equity share capital but it will also include preference share capital provided it is convertible into equity share that means in order to compute the percentage correct in order to compute the majority stakes we not only take into account the equity share capital but we also take into account what we call preference share capital that is convertible preference share capital so in this case now we may say that edge company has got control over s limited and s limited is our subsidiary company now this question question number four actually before i explain this particular question let me also just tell you that this particular question in fact deals with AS14. This question deals with AS14. Remember one thing, AS14 also prescribes accounting, also prescribes accounting in the books of purchasing company. AS14 prescribes accounting in the books of purchasing company. However, you must understand that AS14 can be adopted by only such companies which are not coming under the parameters of what we call NDAs. So, still there are some companies which are not falling under the parameters of NDAs. So, quite obviously, they cannot follow what we call NDAs 3 because NDAs 103 also deals uh, with what we uh, deals with accounting uh, for business combinations in the books of acquirer company. Correct. So, AS14 is still prevalent, but only such companies which are still outside the vicinity of the NDAs, only such companies are going to follow AS14. Suppose there is a particular company and that company is outside the parameters of NDAs, that means that company is not liable to actually prepare its accounts as per NDAs. So, that company will have to follow what we call AS14. Number one, as per AS14, if how the accounting will be done in the books of purchasing company correct before we do the accounting as per as 14 the company must see to it that whether it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger or whether it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase before we start doing the accounting in the books of purchasing company as per AS14, we need to categorize the case into amalgamation in the nature of merger or amalgamation in the nature of purchase. Standard says that a case will become a case of merger when following conditions are satisfied. Now, what are those conditions? One condition among them is that purchasing company must take over all assets and liability. Second condition is that all the assets and liability must be taken over at book value must be taken over at book values third condition is that purchasing company will deliver purchase consideration but only to the to the shareholders only to the equity shareholders the purchase consideration will be given by purchasing company only to the shareholders and purchase consideration must be given by way of equity shares that is also very important but there is an exception also i do not want to confuse you unnecessarily in in case of fractional shares cash can be given that's a different matter but otherwise only shares will be given and next point is that nearly 90 percent of the shareholder of the vendor company must be willing to become the shareholder of the purchasing company correct 90% of the shareholder must be willing to become the shareholder of the purchasing company. And point number E is that if it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger, then purchasing company will not only take over assets and liability, but purchasing company will also take over all the reserves, all the reserves of the vendor company. 
not only assets liability but its general reserve and whatever types of reserve all the reserves will be taken over by purchasing company and it is known as pooling interest method as we saw under common control correct so this is amalgamation in the nature of merger if any of these condition will get violated then it becomes a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase in case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase all the assets and liabilities will be taken over sorry whatever assets have been taken over and whatever liabilities have been taken over if revised values are available we will consider them at revised value correct so that is very important in case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase next important point is that in case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase generally the purchasing company will not take over the reserves which are appearing in the books of the vendor company generally it will not take over however sometime if there are some statutory reserves if there are some statutory reserves statutory reserves like export profit surplus as recently i took a class actually where in the books of aquaria i told you about the accounting over there i also talked at great length the different type of reserves correct there are free reserves there are statutory reserves there are specific reserves so statutory reserves like export profit surplus development reserve investment allowance reserves such reserves are generally maintained by a company due to pressure by the government or because of what we call some uh, pressure by the law correct especially if we are operating in a uh, notified area sometime the law of the land or some other provisions of the law actually put up a sort of mandation upon us that we have to create some sort of reserve and for a particular period of time suppose i am a particular company at this particular moment and i am operating in a notified zone and let us say i am supposed to maintain a statutory reserve for next 10 years for next 10 year but after the 8th year let us say my particular company has been taken over by some other company now because out of 10 year 8 years have gone by so that mean statutory reserve still should be maintained for two more years correct so that mean if the company which is taking over that company now will be under mandation to what we call maintain this reserve for at least next two years so that so that 10 years period get elapsed now the point need to be understand that if statutory reserves are appearing in the books of the vendor company then generally the purchasing company will not take over any type of reserve general reserve free reserve as we call it or a specific reserve purchasing company will take only assets and liability and nothing else if if it it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase and generally the case happens to be amalgamation in the nature of purchase only so generally purchasing company will not take over however however if there is statutory reserves in the books of vendor company and it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase then and question says that statutory reserves need to be maintained for some more period let us say two year three years in that case purchasing company will have to take it and purchasing company will pass an entry amalgamation adjustment account debit to statutory reserve are you getting my point or not what i said is that generally purchasing company will not take the statutory reserve or for that instance any type of reserve profit or loss account general reserve of vendor company if it happens to be a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase but under rare circumstances under rare circumstances if the question states that statutory reserves need to be maintained for a particular specified period of time in that case purchasing company will have to bring those statutory reserves in their books and they will have to pass an entry amalgamation adjustment account debit to statutory reserves now in this question honestly speaking i need to require to go through the entire question only thing is that there is a company by the name of dec limited there is a company by the name of 31st december as a 31st December 2021, a particular company has equity share capital of 475. Unnecessarily to confuse you, it is given. It has got tangible fixed asset and statutory reserves, general reserves. Besides, it has got 80 lakhs worth of current liability and current assets and non-current liabilities of 30 lakhs. Now, question further states that 40% statutory reserves are to be maintained for two more years. 40% statutory reserves are to be maintained for two more years. So if it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase, then purchasing company must pass an entry amalgamation at amalgamation adjustment account debit to statutory reserve. This should this should be the way of writing the answer. Don't go by this particular answer. 
honestly speaking in this particular case at least because it is not clearly defining whether it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger or whether it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase correct so if it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger then 40 percent of statutory reserve ha have to be maintained for two more years so i will compute 40 percent of 25 lakh and pass an entry in the books of purchasing company if it happens to be a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase however if it happens to be a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger in that case i need not require to pass any separate entry because in that case it is quite obvious that obvious that purchasing company will take over all the assets all the liabilities and all the reserves so in that case i need not require to open it separately i will take the what we call statutory reserve general reserve and even what we call profit and loss account or whatever types of reserves are appearing in case of merger actually we have to bring forward all the reserves of the vendor company in the books of purchasing company also so that should be your answer However, here the answer which is given to you is that there is no need to open amalgamation adjustment account in this case because it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger. However, nowhere in the question it is clearly given that it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger. So you have to write from both the perspective. If it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger, no need to actually open amalgamation adjustment account. But if it is a case of purchase, then this entry must be passed. Actually, for a while, you can take the assumption that it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger because in this particular case, uh, it is uh, that it is written that business of May Limited is taken over by Jiva Ram Limited for rupees six hundred lakh, and it is given that purchase consideration is discharged discharge by issue of equity share. So one condition is quite obviously satisfied that equity share, all the assets and liabilities are being taken over because business is taken over automatically means all the assets and liabilities are taken over. Of course, purchase consideration is being delivered by way of equity share. That is also fine in this particular case. Uh, and uh, market value of equity share is so we are not concerned with that. Is there any need to open? Um, uh, is there any need to open amalgamation adjustment account? But just on the basis of this information, we cannot figure it out whether it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of merger or whether it is a case of amalgamation in the nature of purchase. So it is better to write the answer from both the perspective. Correct. So AS14 also I discussed along with that. Next question is related to what we call a company is a company is in a dispute involving allegation of infringement of patents by the competitive company and they are seeking a damage of rupees 500 lakhs but directors are of the opinion that claim can be successfully resisted by the company how will you deal with the particular case because a case is going on at this particular moment at this particular moment obviously there is present obligation there is some sort of obligation upon us there is present obligation number one as per AS29. There is present obligation. Why? Because case is running and other party is seeking some damages and damages is a huge amount of 500 lakhs. But at the same time, probability of outflow of funds is not there. Probability of outflow of funds. Probability of outflow of funds is not there. Why? Because your directors feel that you can successfully resist the case. So if there is present obligation, but probability of outflow of funds is not there, then it, sh it will be recognized as a contingent liability by way of notes. That's all. So it will be recognized as by way of contingent liability. Correct? Question number five. Then there is question number six. And question number six is pretty strong question and it is very difficult for the student to do this particular question. Uh, such questions sh can, should be asked. There is no harm in asking the question. But at the same time, such sort of questions should be there at least in the module so that then you have a right to ask such question to be very honest with you. Because it is quite a tough question, not easy for the student and for that instance for anybody to solve this particular question. Let me be very open. It is very important that uh, 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 institute's module must contain question of such nature, strength and intensity, then it looks better and more compatible that uh, such questions are tossed in the examination. I will explain because whatever question will be asked, we will try to solve it. Even though you will not get the solution of this question anywhere, but I will solve it for you. And within a flick of second, I will solve. However, as I told you, I take great pride in solving this question, but it is very difficult. 
now if you will look into even your scanner they have so they have uh, uh, written all the what we call questions but they have skipped these two questions because they couldn't solve it out to be very honest with you so now i am solving it and soon you will have the solutions of this question everywhere goodwill on the basis of capitalization of super profits is given to you actually question honestly speaking can be tough you can say and but point is that something looks tough if you haven't done it in the past it is quite obviously because nowhere i found that any such question and you must have also found it out that these two type of questions actually are not given anywhere in your module but i must feel that module must contain question i'm not telling that ex absolutely similar question but at least question of such strength so that student get a fairer idea regarding the questions which may be at, at least asked in the examination and accordingly they can try and attempt it goodwill on the basis of capitalization of super profits is given to you five lakh goodwill on the basis of now in this particular question because i will do it slowly for you it is given in this case that goodwill on the basis of on the basis of capitalization of super profits is 5 lakh they have given valuation of goodwill on the basis of capitalization of super profits and besides that they have also given goodwill on the basis of capitalization of average profit is 3 lakh so by on the basis of capitalization of super profits valuation of goodwill is 5 lakh and on the basis of capitalization of average profits valuation of goodwill happens to be only 3 lakhs that's the problem okay this is the situation which is given to us till up to this point now further it is given goodwill further it is given that goodwill on the basis of four years purchase of super profit is equal to two lakh it is given to us now in the next line goodwill on the basis of super profits 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 at four years purchase now just pay attention if i am going to compute goodwill on the basis of super profits at four years purchase that means first of all i must have had computed super profits and then i must have had multiplied it with four to compute the amount of goodwill so that means in order to find out super profits we take average profits and from the average profit we subtract the normal profits we subtract the normal profits isn't it or not we subtract the normal profits we subtract the normal profits and we know that normal profit actually is capital employed into normal rate of return right now i am not having normal profits also but one thing i know that by subtracting normal profit from average profit i will get what we call super profits this figure is also not available at this moment but what i have got is that by multiplying this figure by four four years of purchase by multiplying super profits with four years of purchase i will get the amount of goodwill years of purchase years of purchase is four year given in the question and question has also told you in this particular case where is the question uh, goodwill on the basis of four years purchase of super profit is two lakh now it is given to you that your goodwill is equal to two lakh at four years purchase of super profits now if you have the amount of goodwill you have the amount of years of purchase you let me know what would be what we call your super profits quite obviously your super profits must be equal to 50000 because 50000 into 4 could be only 2 lakh now at least i have been able to derive what we call value of super profit correct number 1 now i have got the valuation of super profits in my hand now what i should be aware of if you have watched the lectures on valuation of goodwill of mine then in the very first session especially wherein i discussed all the methods right from the scratches 
from average profit method, super profits method, capitalization method. Over there, while discussing the capitalization method, I told one thing very important that you can get the valuation of goodwill by simply dividing super profits by normal rate of return. Correct? You can simply divide the super profits by the normal rate of return and super profits divided by normal rate of return will give you the capitalized value of goodwill. Will give you the capitalized value of goodwill. Is it clear to you or not? So that is the situation in this particular case you need to understand. So what point I am trying to make you clear, I can compute the capitalized value of goodwill by dividing super profits by the normal rate of return. So I can get the valuation of the goodwill. Now, in this particular case, you need to understand one thing. You have been given that to capitalization of super profits, goodwill was given to you as 5 lakhs. Goodwill was given to you as 5 lakhs. Well then, goodwill value is 5 lakh as per capitalization of super profits. And we have the amount of super profits which we just computed. Amount of super profit is equal to 50,000. Is it clear to you? That means I can find out normal rate of return. So normal rate of return is 10. And remember, normal rate of return is always in percentage. So I will call it 10%. That means now I have been able to find out this rate, 10%, normal rate percentage. Second important point I have found out. First, I found out super profits. Now I have found out the normal rate of return also. Next thing which you should be aware of, this is the third important point. We have been given goodwill on the basis of capitalization of super profit as 5 lakh and goodwill on the basis of capitalization of average profit as 3 lakh. If I will take the difference of both these two items, then one another thing I can get. See here, if I will apply 10% to the capital employed, It must be equal to this difference. I have already told you very deep knowledge in this particular case is needed to solve this particular question because we hardly expect such knowledge from this student to be very honest with you. We must take the difference of these two items that because these two items, it is capitalized value of goodwill. Valuation of goodwill on the basis of capitalization as per super profit is 5 lakh, as per average profit is 3 lakh. So difference is 2 lakh and my normal rate of return is 10%. So if I if I am going to apply normal rate of return to the capital employed, I will get the figure equal to this difference. And now I can find the amount of capital employed. So my capital employed, if you'll find that is 2 lakh into 100 divided by 10 will be equal to 20 lakhs. Normally, we require only capital employed to solve the question. But in this question, actually, further it is given to confuse you that your opening capital employed is two-third of the closing capital employed. Indirectly, it means in this particular question, average capital employed is being considered because opening and closing capital is given in the question. So actually, this is the capital employed. So I will have to average it. So in order to average it, I will divide it by two. So my average capital employed will be equal to 10 lakh. So I have found now capital employed also. This is the four, This is the third important point I have found out. First super profit. Then I have found out the normal rate of return. Now I have found the average capital employed. Now see here, if I have found out the average capital employed, just wait, mouse has slipped. And I just told you, in order to compute the normal profit here, what I need capital employed. And here capital employed stands for average capital employed. My average capital employed is 10 lakh. Now I have found it out. Normal rate of return is 10%. So my normal profit must be equal to, must be equal to how much? How much is the capital employed? Uh, 1 lakh. So my no normal profits must be equal to 1 lakh, 10 lakh into 10%. Now see, 
you have the super profits you have the normal profits now you can find out what was your amount of average profit that must be equal to 150000 that must be equal to 150000 now if your if your average profit is equal to 150000 question is simply asking us calculate the value of goodwill of the firm at 3 years purchase of average profit now i have found out the value of average profit all i have to do is to multiply it with 3 to find out the answer that is 450000 is it clear to you i told you it's a tough question there is another question this is very very tough question and it will consume a lot of time to make you not not to solve uh, you you must have seen uh, it i hardly took one or two minutes to solve the question and to make you understand also because basic time of mine will uh, elapse in uh, or expire should i say actually in making you understand the concept but i want you to understand this concept very thoroughly so that is the reason i will solve this question along with section c where we will take up long questions we got three long questions are there so it is better because all those questions will demand a bit of time so i will solve this question over there there is no point in unnecessarily solving and without your without you not comprehending the same so there is no point in it a cosmetic articles producing company provides the following information so there is a company same question is also available in my accounting standard notes and of course in lectures also same question same names and everything is same this question has been taken from as24 correct which deals with discontinued operation as24 in this question what is given to you that there are two products cold cream and vanishing cream with the passage of the time you will notice that the production of the cold cream is falling down from 5 lakh to 250 to 0 now from january to october from january to september production is 5 lakh but from october to december the production is reduced to 2 lakh 50000 units and from january to march 2001 production has become zero on the contrary if you will note towards the your right hand side you'll find that production of vanishing cream actually has gone up and slowly and gradually and steadily it is moving up now here also it is given that company has enforced a gradual change in the product line gradual change in the product line means slowly and steadily company is shifting away what we call from cold cream to vanishing cream but under an overall plan company that means it's a long-term plan company must have actually done proper assessment and company feels so that by producing vanishing cream in greater quantity perhaps in the long run we may have what we call better future board of director of the company passed a resolution on 2020 to this effect the following the calendar year state with reason whether it should be treated as discontinued operation you have to cite the reason and you have to tell whether it is a discontinued operation or not first of all you need to write that it is a case covered by as24 and second you need to write that change in change in product mix change in product line you can write also change in product line gradually or gradual change in product line better you would write i have written this way but you better write gradual change in product line correct so change in product line gradually under an overall plan under an overall plan overall plan is not considered as discontinued operation so it will not be considered as discontinued operation correct so that is the reason the reason you have provided that it is mere shifting of product line from one particular line to the other line we are shifting and we are shifting gradually under an overall plan so it cannot be termed as discontinued operation as far as 9 is concerned in this question it is written that on 1st of april 2020 share capital of s limited consists of 10 crore equity share capital of 10 each this question is similar to the one which we did earlier i think and it also has rupees 12 crore worth of 12 percent preference share capital and which is convertible into equity share it is absolutely similar to that on 1st of july H Limited acquired 50 lakh equity share and 6.2 lakh preference shares of S Limited. Till up to this line, this question is similar to the one which I explained earlier. 
No doubt that in this particular case, as per the same data which we took earlier, I would say that now H Limited is the parent company without any doubt because H Limited has acquired more than 50% of the voting rights and voting rights, as I told you earlier, will not only include equity share but also such preference shares which are convertible into equity share. So H Limited now holds control over S Limited. Actually, the answer which is given to you, to be honest with you, I do not agree completely with this particular answer. This is my personal opinion. I will try to suggest you a better answer. So in this case, S Limited actually has become parent company of H Limited has become parent company of S Limited because now it has 50% of the equity share capital and also preference share capital of S Limited and they have got the majority stake no doubt about that. Logically if you are the parent company or holding company then you are supposed to prepare consolidated financial statement this should be your answer please write it by yourself. Correct logically H Limited should prepare the consolidated financial statement. But in this question, it is mentioned that they acquired the share with a view to their subsequent disposal on 1st of June 2021. So if I invest somewhere, even though if I control that particular entity, but my intention to invest here is to subsequently sell the stakes. In that case, the standard AS21 actually says that parent need not require to prepare a consolidated financial statement. So in this question, instead of writing this line, you should better write it as per AS21. If parent limited holds what we call shares in subsidiary company for the purpose of subsequent disposal, for the purpose of subsequent disposal, here holding company is having stakes in S limited for subsequent disposal or subsequent disposal subsequent disposal so that is so that is why h limited need not require to prepare consolidated financial statement so in that case however in their separate financial statement in their separate financial statement h limited will account the investment of course they will account the investment as per as 13 and of course at cost correct in this question till up to this particular line till up to this point it is okay there is no need to actually write this hence the cost of control is not required to be calculated on 31st of march 2021 obviously if we are not preparing consolidated financial statement that automatically means neither we are computing cost of control nor non non controlling interest nor goodwill in fact we are not doing anything which we are supposed to do when we prepare consolidated financial statements correct next question is again this question has been taken from our notes and this question under AS18 is given same question same figures everything is same correct you must have noticed so many questions in the examinations straight away taken from our notes in this question P limited P limited is having 60% voting rights in Q limited and Q limited has 20% voting rights in R limited also P limited directly enjoys 14% rights in R Limited. Further, it is given R Limited is a listed company. It regularly supplies goods to P Limited. And management wants to know whether the relationship between the P Limited and R Limited correct, should be disclosed or not. So, related party disclosures are required or not. First of all, we need to understand in this case that P Limited, which is having 60% control of what we call Q Limited, this is Q Limited and P Limited is having 60% control of Q Limited and Q Limited has also invested in R Limited but the control of Q Limited in R Limited is only 20%. Besides, P Limited has also invested in R Limited to the extent of 14%. So as far as P Limited is concerned, as far as P Limited and R Limited is concerned, I would say that P Limited directly is controlling 14% because it has got direct stakes of 14% in R Limited. This is direct stakes and indirectly P Limited 
is also controlling through Q limited, R limited. Indirect control, if you want to compute the percentage, will be computed in this manner. Because P limited has invested in 60% stakes of Q limited, so 60% of 20% because Q limited has 20% stakes. So 20% of 60% will be equal to 12. So indirectly, it means P limited has, you will write in, in this manner, P limited has 26% stakes in R limited, 14% direct and 12% indirect. Correct. So P limited, as far as is concerned, it is having 20% stakes in R limited. It is controlling 14% directly and indirectly 12%. Number one. Number two, if your stakes are, because our stakes are more than 20%, we have 26% stakes in R limited. If our stakes are 26%, that means we are exercising more than 20% stakes. And if we have more than 20% stakes, it means we have significant influence over R limited. That means P limited is exercising significant influence over R limited. Why? Because it is having more than 20% stakes in R limited, that is 14% directly and 12% indirectly. Now, if you are having a significant influence over the other entity, then all the transaction which your company is doing with the other entity must be actually reflected and disclosed. So, related party disclosure need to be made. Question number 11, as far as is concerned in this particular question, it is written that cashier of X limited embezzled with the cash amount of rupees 5 lakh. Now, this question is related to AS4. Again, this question is available in our notes also. Correct. In this question, what is happening? Accounting year is ending on. Uh, let us say came to the notice of april 21 let us say accounting year is ending on 31st of 3 2021 this is the end of the reporting period and in the month of april 21 we found that there is cash embezzlement so some fraud regarding cash has taken place embezzlement as you know as4 deals with events occurring after the balance sheet date and I told you over there also that there are two types of what we call basically uh, uh, things which we which we have to deal up with under AS4, adjusting events and non-adjusting events. Now, it is a case of adjusting events. Correct. Why it is a case of adjusting events? Because this cash embezzlement is related to an item on the reporting date cash. It will materially affect the calculation or the estimation of the amount of cash. So, because this particular event has got relation to an item on the date of the balance sheets so it will be treated as a adjusting event as per as4 your answer should be the present case falls under the vicinity of as4 number one it is an adjusting item why because it is related to conditions or item on the date of reporting that is cash in this case so all the adjusting item need to be disclosed in the financial statement this is how you are going to write the answer of this particular question 12. Y Limited purchased a machinery for 80 lakhs and its useful life is 4 years and its residual value is 16 lakhs and it received government grant of 32 lakh. Further question says that refund of grant was made in the beginning of the third year. Calculate the depreciation for the third year but the important point which you need to pay attention is if the grant is credited to deferred grant account. Now you should be aware of one important point that as per AS12, so many times I have told you, as per AS12, if we receive grants, if we receive grants from the government of course, and grant is in connection with depreciable asset, depreciable asset like plant and machinery, then entity has two options. Entity has two options. Option one is that entity can take the amount of the grant to the credit or profit and loss account. That means this grant which we have received from the government can be credited to the asset account. Can be credited to the asset account means suppose if I am going to receive the grant, I will write the entry bank account debit to government grant. This is the entry. And then this government grant can be credited to let us say plant and machinery. So one option is that I can use the grant 
and I can credit it to plant and machinery indirectly, it will reduce the cost of the asset. Another option with me is, another option with me is that I will receive the amount of the grant bank account debit to government grant and instead of crediting it to the relevant asset, I can simply take the grant account, government grant account to deferred government grant. I can credit the amount to deferred government grant. So in this question, question is saying that grant amount is not credited to the asset account. It is credited to the grant deferred government grant account. Deferred government grant account. That means in this particular case, you purchased a machinery for 80 lakhs. If you are going to purchase the machinery for 80 lakhs, your entry will be first of all plant and machinery account debit to bank account or cash account, whatever you may like. 80 lakhs worth of machinery you have purchased in the beginning of the first year, quite obviously. When you will reach the end of the first year, what entry you are going to pass, you are going to provide depreciation, obviously. But before that, you have received government grant. Government grant we have received, we will write the entry bank account debit to government grant account. And we receive the amount equal to 32 lakhs. But we did not credit it. In, instead, we credited it to deferred government grants. So, I will write another entry, government grant account debit to deferred government grant account in the beginning of the first year. Now, I will reach the end of the, <coughs> I will reach the end of the first year, uh, first year. At the end of the first year, at the end of the first year, I will have to provide the depreciation. So, my entry will be depreciation account debit. Ultimately, this depreciation will be debited to profit and loss to plant and machinery account. So, what will be the amount of depreciation? Because 80 lakh is the cost of the machinery. And remember, amount of grant was not credited to plant and machinery. So, your cost will remain at 80 lakh. Residual value is 16 lakh. So, divided by 4, that is equal to 64 divided by 4 is equal to 16 lakh. So, depreciation at the end of the first year, you are going to provide 16 lakh. Similarly, at the end of the second year, you are again going to provide depreciation of 16 lakh. Correct? You are again going to provide this. Refund of grant was made in the beginning of the third year. Now, question says that you have refunded the amount of the grant at the end of the third year. Now, at the, of the, end, at the end of the second year, total depreciation in the first year is 16, in the second year is 16. Correct? Is it clear to you or not? Now see here, when I will refund the grant, my entry will be deferred government grant, that is beginning of the third year. This is the beginning of the third year. In the beginning of the third year, my entry will be deferred government grant account debit to bank account. for refund entry beginning of the third year because whatever grant I received, I simply credited it to deferred government grant account. So that is why when I will refund, whatever amount I credited to deferred government grant, I will debit the same and I will simply write to bank. This will be your entry for refund of government grant. Is it clear to you? So even depreciation at the end of the third year, this is third year, at the end of the third year, our depreciation will remain same. Are you getting my point or not in this particular case? Question number 13 is mere repetition of the earlier question. You can do it by yourself. Correct? Mere repetition of the earlier question. So you need to understand that question number 13 is similar to the question which we just did a moment ago. It is again related to cash embezzlement and the same question, same answer will be there. Now we come across, <coughs> six, this is related to AS17. This is related to AS17, correct? As per AS17, AS17 basically deals with, you can say, finding out of reportable segments. We have to find out in this case, which are the reportable segments. And you know, 
any segment will be treated any segment will be treated as reportable seg segment if that segment is able to satisfy any of this criteria any of these criteria one criteria is segment segment asset criteria second is segment result criteria this is segment result criteria and of course third one is revenue criteria and what is the criteria criteria as we know is 10 percent of 10 percent or more 10 percent or more 10 percent of six uh, this asset uh, segment assets sorry 10 percent of total assets and similarly total revenue and total result we have to find out the reportable segments now see here if you want to do quickly these are the segment assets segment result and segment revenue is given first of all let us find out the threshold criteria threshold criteria means the minimum criteria which the segment must meet to be categorized as reportable segment now first of all we take the segment assets now total segment asset is equal to 200 total segment asset is equal to 200 so i will compute 10 percent of this so that means the threshold limit is 20 threshold limit is 20 means now let us say this is segment m because segment m has segment asset of 100 that is more than the threshold limit so it will be considered as reportable segment even this will be considered as reportable segment m n even this will be considered as reportable segment because it has got exactly 10 percent segment asset but p q and r will not be considered p q and r will not be considered as reportable segment as per this criteria now we take segment revenue this is segment result criteria segment result criteria first of all in case of segment result you compute as you earlier computed total assets now you compute total profits total profits and total loss you have to compute it separately see here this is loss minus 100 minus 280 minus 20 so total loss is equal to 400 and if i compute total profits 160 20 and 20 that is 180 plus 20 is equal to 200 total profits is equal to 200 in case of results we have to be careful that this is your loss and this is your profit but out of this you will take the bigger figure higher figure the higher figure is 400 higher figure is 400 now you compute irrespective of the fact whether it is loss or gain you compute 10 percent of it so your threshold limit is 40 in this case now let us check segment result whether loss or profit don't worry about that it is 100 100 is more than 40 so that means in this case m is reportable segment 280 is more than 40 it is also reportable segment 160 is more than 40 it is also reportable segment it has got 20 it is not reportable segment p q also is not a reportable segment and r is also not a reportable segment as per this particular criteria is it clear to you similarly revenue criteria total is 2000 so i will take 10 percent of 2000 so minimum criteria in this case will become 200 let us have a look m is satisfying because it is having a revenue of 400 whereas threshold is 200 640 also m n even o and p is not satisfying and q is not satisfying and r is also not satisfying so now you can deliver the answer correct if any of the criteria is satisfied then that if any of the criteria it is not necessary that you should satisfy all the criteria whether you are able to satisfy asset criteria result criteria or revenue criteria you can be categorized as a reportable segment Question number 15 says that cost of closing stock is 5 lakh. Realizable value is 120%. Realizable expense is 5%. At what amount is stock will be reflected in the income statement of Malia Limited, which is not a going concern? Again, which is not a going concern? I told you in the beginning itself, if you are not a going concern, you will have to reflect it at realizable value. So you have to compute the net realizable value. Net realizable value first of all i will compute the realizable value realizable value is 5 lakh into 120 percent so into 120 percent of 5 lakh will be equal to 6 lakh 
I will subtract 5% realization expenses which will be equal to 30,000. So 5,70,000 is the amount at which it will be reflected in the income statement and of course in the balance sheet. Question number 16 actually deals with what we call your AS29. Same question is available. Even this particular question is also available. AS16 actually states that, uh, and as I told you, it is related to AS29. In this case, actually, there is an airlines company. There is an airlines company. And as per the question, this particular airline company need to actually overhaul its aircraft once in every three years. Once in every three years. See, whenever you will be given in the question once in three years, at least once in five years, you must understand. Just hold on for a while. I have to just give me a minute. Correct? Just give me a minute or so. Extremely sorry for this uh, short interruption. Anyway, I was talking about this particular ca case that this particular case study is covered by AS29. And I was trying to tell you that whenever it would be given in the question that you are supposed to incur some sort of what we call expenditure, but timeline is also given to you. In that particular case, always presume that on the reporting date, there is no present obligation. Present obligation itself means obligation on the reporting date. You have no present obligation in case, in this case, sorry. And in this case, rather, you have future obligation because once in three years, you are supposed to overhaul your what we call aircrafts. Correct? That means obviously when you will do the overhauling, you will have to spend some expenditure. So logically, you have to create a provision. But problem is that there is no present obligation. So right now, I need not require to create any provision in this particular case. Is it clear to you or not? So your answer will be case covered by AS29, no present obligation because overhauling need to be done once in three years. That means company has future obligation. However, company can create provision for some penalties or fines in case if that may be imposed. That is how you have to deliver the answer. Correct? Now we pick up. Just wait. Mike, as I told you, sorry, mouse moves here and there. That creates problem. Now, as far as 17 is concerned, in this particular case, it is written that state government, lots of questions are from AS12 actually. State the treatment of 20 lakhs received from central government as subsidy for setting up a plant in backward area and cost of the plant is 100. While explaining the A, while explaining AS12, when I explained AS12, the first point which I told you is that if you are an entity, if you are an entity and if you operate in a notified zone, NZ, notified zone, or for, for that distance in a backward area. Indirectly, when you are operating in a notified zone or backward area, it means you are helping the government because you are trying to develop that particular area. Correct? So, when we operate in a notified zone, government gives us some subsidy or some grants, whatever it is. But indirectly, our operations are also helping the government. And government is interested in promoting the what we call welfare of the society. They want to have a balanced growth of the economy. So that is why they want the entity and the entrepreneurs to come and operate in notified zones. So that is why the government also provides you some subsidy. So when you get subsidy, but at the same time, you are helping the promoter. Promoter here is government. Is it clear to you or not? So that is why in this case such type of grant is no grant is considered as in the nature of promoters contribution in the nature of promoters contribution so how will you write the answer please write by yourself first of all this is case this case covered by as12 number one 
Number two, it will be treated as grant in the nature of promoter's interest because entity is operating in backward area. Number three, such grant will be credited to capital reserve. When we will receive the grant, our entry will be bank account, debit to government grant, no doubt about that. But we will credit this government grant to capital reserve. So my entry will be government grant account debit to capital reserve. If you want to elaborate further, you can also write that whatever amount is there in capital reserve, it will become part of shareholders fund because shareholders fund means share capital plus all reserves. Also, because it is capital reserve, it cannot be utilized for the purpose of bonus issue or for that purpose, what we call dividend. Now, question number 18. X Limited purchased a machinery for rupees 80 lakh, useful life 4 years, residual life 16 lakhs. Government grant received 32 lakhs. This is the same question, but this time refund of grant is made in the beginning of the third year. Till up to this, it is absolutely similar to the one which we just did a moment ago, but only difference is that calculate the depreciation for the third year if grant is credited to fixed asset. In that case, grant was credited to deferred government grant. In this case, grant is credited to fixed asset. So that is the only problem. So first of all, so first of all, in the beginning of the first year, this then sometime no creates problem. Beginning of the first year, in the beginning of the first year, you have purchased a plant, your entry is plant and machinery account debit to bank account, correct? Of course, 80 lakh. You received grant from the government bank account debit to government grant account. You received grant equal to 32 lakhs. And now you credited the grant to the plant and machinery account. So government grant account debit to plant and machinery account. So cost of your plant will get reduced by 32 lakh because now plant is getting credited by it, isn't it or not? So now at the end of the first year, you will reach the end of the first year. At the end of the first year, you will provide the depreciation. How will you provide the depreciation? Now your net cost is 80 lakh minus grant amount 32 lakh. That is equal to 48 lakh. This is your net cost. Net cost is 48 lakh and your residual value is 16 lakhs. Residual value is 16 lakh and you have to divide it by 4. So that will be equal to 8 lakhs. 48 minus 16 is 32. 32 divided by 4 lakhs. So 8 lakh worth of depreciation at the end of the first year you are going to provide. Your depreciation amount will be depreciation account debit to plant and machinery account. At the end of the first year, these are the entry in the first year. At the end of the second year, you will repeat this entry. Depreciation account debit to plant and machinery account. You will repeat this entry. At the end of second year, you will provide the depreciation also again. Now we will reach the beginning of the third year. Now in the beginning of the third year, first of all, let me ask what is the carrying amount of the asset? Now, carrying amount of plant and machinery, see here, carrying amount of plant and machinery at the end of the, after subtracting what we call amount of government grant is 32, that means initial cost was 80, we subtracted 32 lakh, net cost became 48 lakh. Then we provided depreciation for the first year and for the second year also. That means total 32 lakh worth of depreciation we have provided. So 48 lakh minus 48 minus 32, that is equal to 16 lakh. That is equal to 16 lakh. So we may say that at the in the beginning or at the end of the second year or at the beginning of this uh, third year, the carrying amount of plant and machinery is equal to 16 lakh. Now in the beginning, what happened? We have to refund the amount. Because we credited the amount to plant and machinery earlier. See, before you refund the amount of the government grant, you need to visualize actually where you took the amount of grant earlier. You credited it to plant and machinery. When you receive the grant amount, it means due to that your cost of plant and machinery got reduced. So now you will increase it. That means at the beginning of the first year, 
you will have to pass an entry like this plant and machinery account debit to bank account when you will refund the grant amount the value of the plant and machinery will increase by 32 so because of refund now your revised cost of your plant and machinery it is known in account as revised cost so the revised cost will be equal to 48 lakh and question is asking at the end of the third year how much depreciation i need to provide now out of four years two years have gone by so the depreciation for the remaining period because remaining period is two so depreciation for the third year and even for the fourth year will be equal to 24 we are concerned with the third year so in the third year depreciation is equal to 24 lakh correct 19 is also related to refund of grant now Actually, I told you, now I have told you almost everything about AS12. Under AS12, I told you, if you are an entity operating in a notified or backward zone, in that case, generally the government grant which you receive, that government grant is credited to capital reserve. I told you. I also told you, if grant is received for depreciable assets, then in that case, we have option 1 and option 2, as I told earlier. We can take the grant to the credit of asset account or we can take the grant amount to the credit of what we call deferred government grant. And there is another last situation. If let us say government has given us some grant because we have incurred some welfare expenses or we have undertaken some activities of welfare nature and those activities are of revenue nature, correct? So in that case, government supports us by giving some grant. So if we have incurred some revenue expenditure and government has given us some grant, in that case, generally the entry for receipt of grant will be bank account debit to government grant account. Let us say in this case we receive 10 lakh. Because we spent some amount for employees welfare activities. Correct? And later on we had to refund this grant because of non fulfillment of the prescribed conditions. So when we had received the grant, we must have had passed this entry. And generally, in case of such grant, which are given by government to support the what we call, as I told you, some welfare activities, generally such grant is taken to the government grant account. Generally, such grant is taken to either profit or loss account straightway, or we can take it to deferred government grant account also or we can also take it to deferred government grant also, correct? And once we have taken it to deferred government grant, then slowly and gradually every year we are going to take some portion of the amount to the profit or loss account or we can straight away take it to profit or loss account. It is our discretion. Let us say I received 10 lakh from the government grant and I credited it to profit or loss account. Now I have to refund it because of non-fulfillment non of some conditions, prescribed conditions. When I will refund, I told you several times, you need to understand where you took the grant. You took the grant to profit and loss account. So in this case, your entry will be profit and loss account debit to bank account for refund. Suppose if you had taken the amount of the grant to the deferred government grant account, then your entry would have been deferred government grant account debit to bank account. Are you getting my point or not? So that means in case of refund of such grants which you have received for meeting uh, for meeting some social welfare activities, generally such grants are taken either to profit or loss account or to deferred government grant account. So at the time of refund, this is your refund. The refund amount should be adjusted to deferred government grant account provided some balance is there or to profit and loss account if we have taken the amount to profit and loss account. Now, there could be another possibility. Let us say out of 10 lakh I have taken to, I received 10 lakh and I took 10 lakh to the deferred government grant account. Correct? And in the next year, out of deferred government grant, I took 3 lakh to the profit and loss account. And after that, I had to refund the grant. Because in the deferred government grant, in the first year, I took 10 lakh. And then in the next year, out of deferred government grant, I took 3 lakh to profit and loss account. That means 
now in the deferred government grant account there is balance of 7 lakh only now in this case if i would have had refund my entry would have been 10 lakh amount of refund because in deferred government grant account 7 lakh is there i will adjust the refund amount 7 lakh to the extent of available balance in deferred government grant account and the excess refund will be debited to profit and loss account so this is how the refund entry you are going to do in this particular case is it clear to you or not and finally in this particular again this is the last question of as4 in uh, or as5 sorry i think and yes as5 last question of ours same question is presented here so as5 notes you can find out this particular question here Jet Limited signed an agreement with the Employees Union for Revision of Wages in June 2021. In June 2021, you signed. Because agreement is signed in the month of June 2021. That mean current accounting year must have started on 1-4-2021 and must have ended on 31st of 3-2022. It is quite clear. The wage revision is with the wage revision is with retrospective effect from 1 4 2019. So we signed an agreement that we will increase your wages from 1 4 2019 itself. From 1 4 2019, that means this year will end over here, and in between, next year will also start 1 4 2021. It will end on 31st 3 2021. So, anyway, agreement is signed over here, and we told them that we will give you areas of wages from this particular period to this particular period. But further, the question says that areas of wages up to 31st 3 2021 amounted to 50 lakh. Just to confuse us, question says that total areas of wages from 1 4 2019 till 31st of 3 2021 is 50 lakh, and from 1 4 2021 to, to this particular date, it is equal to 10 lakh. All in all, in the current year, because this is my current year, in the current year, first of all, in the current year, I will pay my normal wages. Normal wages for 21 and 22, whatever I was paying so far, I will pay those wages. Besides that, now I will have to pay additional wages because of retrospective revision. Correct? Because of retrospective revision, 50 lakh plus 10 lakh total, I will have to pay 50 plus 10. Besides the normal wages of this accounting year or this financial year, I will also pay additional wages of 50 lakh and 10 lakh, total actually 60 lakh. But try to understand in this particular question. Question says that question says that total areas of wages from this particular date to this particular date is 50 lakh, and from this particular date to this particular date is equal to 10 lakh. First of all, you need to understand that areas of wages related to earlier period. Actually, out of 60 lakh, 50 lakhs are related to earlier period. Logically, it should be prior period item, but it will not be considered as prior period item. Why? Because in this case, there is no mistake, no error, no omission. So even though it is related to prior period, but such items are taking place in the current year, not because of any error, mistake, or because of any what we call wrong calculation. It is because of some government dictates or because of some government rules or because of some agreements. So it cannot be treated as prior period item number one. Areas of wages is not a prior period item, so no separate disclosure is required. Because prior period item need to be separately disclosed. Separately disclosed means in a separate line item. Here we need not require to reflect the wages as a separate line item. We can simply write wages. So additional wages along with normal wages will be treated as normal ordinary course of item that means normal expense of the business. So this is how you have to present. So these are the 20 questions of section B and when we will meet you in the next session of obviously we will take up next section and next section is also very important and it will help you in revising because you must have seen just through section A and section B we have revised at least I think 7 to 8 standard itself. Correct? So anyway, that will help us whatever we are going to do, it will help you too. My only advice is that please watch the sessions at 7.30 till 8.30. It is a possibility. Later on, don't blame me. 
I have told you that we are pressurized by our associated side so many times I have told you and so many times but problem is that the student never listen to. They keep on messaging sir please unload it again please sorry make it public make it public again. You must understand our problems also are you, you do not know actually how much I am fighting with my associated sites to release these videos. Next time if I will have such complaints I will have to stop it let me make it absolutely clear. So video can be taken off even immediately after the session. Every day it is not possible to let it stay on, on public platform. So because we have some agreement and we have to follow some protocols with the sites. Please try to understand this. So on such count I will take a bit of you now. Shall meet you in the next session.